So we left off before the exam with this example of Ebola virus. And there is early during Ebola virus, there is um, blistering of the skin. And this is mostly due to the innate system. And so the question is, well, what is Ebola likely going to, uh, what innate signaling pathways are likely activated by Ebola? And the short answer is, all of the rig-like receptor pathways could potentially, um, or sorry, all of the RNA sensing rig-like receptor pathways. The nod-like receptor pathways are almost certainly engaged because when a virus is infecting a cell, it disrupts the, uh, the homeostatic, homeostatic levels of ATP and other things that are sensed by the nod-like receptors. And it's also going to activate the toll-like receptors in the endosomal apartments, particularly TLR7 and 8. So those are some of the potential answers. Um, it's not really going to rec be recognized by scavenger receptors or lectin family proteins because the, the virus typically uses your cell membrane. And so it's very difficult to recognize those as different structures. Okay, so for today, we're going to switch to the adaptive immune system. And before we really start talking about B cell development and T cell development, we really have to start just with the structure of what is an antibody and what are the different parts of it. And then we can talk about how you generate different B cell receptors or antibodies and eventually get to how do you make an, a, an antibody response to something. And so we wanna go back to Ehrlich. Right? Remember, Ehrlich is sort of the grandfather of immunology. Some would argue it's Pasteur, but Ehrlich was really the one who was the first pure immuno immunologist who really wanted to try and understand how do you get an immune response? And so what he did was he immunized mice with low doses of protein toxins, ricin and others. That, um, and when he did this, those mice could become immune to high doses of toxin. Now this is probably based on mythology. Well, at least we think it's mythology. The Vishkanya in um, ancient uh, India were female assassins. And so the, in the mythology of the Vishkanya, they would ingest from birth very low doses of, of poison so they would become immune to it. And those stories have been around for quite a long time. And so Ehrlich did this in mice. And so what he did is he would give mice uh, low doses of toxin. He also did this with bacteria. This was the immunization phase. And then he would challenge mice, those mice, with a high dose of the toxin or live bacteria. And those mice would survive. Whereas if you had not immunized mice and you gave them the same dose of toxin or bacteria, those mice are dead. Now this is actually something that uh, some snake handlers will do. There's a fair, fairly famous one, Robert Haft, who injected himself with 24 venoms every day for most of his life, and he became immune to King Cobra, King Cobra venom as well as other things. Now the important part of this is that Ehrlich noticed some things. And the first thing is that if you immunized mothers, then the offspring would be also immune, at least temporarily. If you immunized fathers, the offspring are not immune. Okay, so um, the immun immunity to the, to the poisons could be passed from mother to, to the neonates, but not from the father. However, you could transfer serum from either the mother or the father to the offspring, and that would provide at least short-lived immunity. Okay, so this is really the basis of, he came up with the idea of the anticorper or antibody, which is something in the serum that can be transferred and protect against either bacteria or toxins. And for those of you who like cult movies, this actually is, is in a lot of movies. We'll talk about some of the other ones later in the semester, but this is from The Princess Bride. If you haven't seen it, you should. Um, and in this movie, the Dread Pirate Roberts, um, here 
I forget the actor's name, <laughs> builds immunity to low doses of this poison called Iocane powder. And then he challenges um, the, the mastermind to a, a duel where he puts the poison in a glass and they have to figure out which one. Well, he just puts the poison in both glasses because he's immune. So this shows up in a surprising number of cultural references, but there's some real basis to it. This can actually happen. So for many years, right, the, um, Ehrlich was really active until the early 1900s, but then it took a while to figure out well, what part of the serum can we, can we isolate these antibodies from? And so with the advent of electrophoresis, which is you put essentially a, a distillate of jellyfish called agarose um, into, a, into a form and then you separate the proteins based on electrical charge. And so Tassilius and Kabat showed that the antibodies are very positively charged. So if they put a you know, electro, a, a negative and a positive charge, the antibodies move the farthest towards the negative charge. And so they called these the alpha, beta, and gamma globulin uh, subunits of serum. And what they noticed first was that if you took the gamma globulin subunit, that you could actually transfer immunity. Okay, so that really was that antibodies or protective immunity was in the gamma globulins. And you probably have heard that term still used sometimes in the medical field, but this is where it comes from. What they also noticed is, is that if they immunized rabbits before doing this and then separated them, then that gamma globulin subunit became uh, much bigger and that became protected for whatever you injected them in the first place. So if it was killed salmonella, now you transfer that gamma globulin and it transfers immunity to salmonella. Okay, so this was the first, okay, so antibodies are in the serum and we can isolate them by electrophoresis. Okay, and many times you'll hear the term gamma globulins. Uh, we also use immunoglobulins and those really are just antibodies. There are different names for them. That gamma globulin is a historical term. It's not really used much anymore. Okay, then we came back to these two guys, right? Heidelberger and, and Avery. And they were able to prove that antibodies were proteins. So they took this gamma globulin fraction and they treated it with proteases and then the immunity went away. Now at the time, Remember, this is before we really knew how genes operated or what the genetic material really was. Uh, I mean, it was still up in the air. And so at the time, they said, okay, well, antibodies were proteins, and so they had to come from genes. Now, at the time, genes didn't mean pieces of DNA. At the time, you had uh, atavism and other strange ideas about how genetic information worked, but they did know that proteins were related to genetic inheritance. So they were right in that time. And then comes along somebody that you may have heard of, of before, a guy named Linus Pauling. And he, he's told the distinction of, have, of one of the few people that has both a Nobel Prize in, um, in science as well as a Nobel Peace Prize. And so, but Linus Pauling was kind of a sneaky guy, or not a sneaky guy. He liked to stir up trouble. And basically what he did is he took two different sets of antibodies that were uh, recognized completely different subset or, or uh, completely different antigens and showed that they had same amino acid comp uh, composition. And it really, this is what led Niels Jern down this uh, screwed up idea of the, of the clonal selection theory where he said, every B cell starts with the same B cell receptor and then once it molds to its antigen, then it remembers that. We know not that was wrong, but he still shared with the, the Nobel Prize. Whereas others said, well, they look roughly the same, but there there's some slight differences. So we'll say that there's they're mostly the same with enough difference to cause, you know, this you know, to recognize different things. And this was the the Burnett and Talmadge clonal selection um, theory. But Linus Pauling showed 
that they basically have the same amino acid composition and it really threw everybody into confusion, which is what he loved to do. And then to settle this, well, it took another eight years or so for Gustav Nossel and Joshua Lederberg. And they show that if you took a B cell clone and that produces antibodies of one specificity and you exposed it to a different antigen, it didn't change the specificity of that B cell. And so they said, sorry, Niels, you're wrong. It's, there's, no, there's no induced fit. It is preset that a B cell has a an antibody receptor or a B cell receptor that is specific for one thing. Now, we still didn't know what antibodies were, what, how they recognized things or how they worked. And it was really Gerald Edelman and Rodney Porter in the US in the, in the early 1960s who, who worked this out in a logic problem kind of way. And the way that they did this is they determined the structure of antibodies based on their cleavage patterns, and they cleave them with different proteases, but also, if they took those different fractions and immunized other animals, what antibodies to those different parts of an antibody would you get? It sounds complicated, but it's not really. So they basically used two different things. They, they actually used a pepsin digestin as well, but it's easiest just to think of it with these two things. If they did a papain digestion, they would get two different, they would get a two to one ratio of what they call the fragment antigen binding and the fragment crystallizable. Now, for those of you who don't know, to crystallize a protein, you can't have any variation in it. So uh, what we call the FC part of the antibody now is often said the constant region. The C originally meant crystallizable. Okay, so if they took it antibodies and they digested it with, with papain, they would get twice as much antigen binding fragment as they would get the crystallizable or constant fragment. But if they did a disulfide reduction of the antibody, they would get a one-to-one -one ratio of heavy to light chain, okay? And so what they came up with was this idea that, okay, you have to have heavy chains. So if I, if I look at an antibody, if I get two heavy chains and two light chains, then I have a one-to-one -one ratio of heavy to light chains of the antibody. On the other hand, if I get a papain digestion, which, which cuts here, then I'll get two FAB fragments and one FC fragment. So these part are the antigen binding parts of it. And this is the constant domain or the crystallizable domain. Now they took this further, okay? If they took the FAB fragments and injected those into goats, so the antibodies came from mice or rabbits, and they injected those uh, rabbit antibodies into a goat, the goat antibodies, if they injected with the FAB fragment, would recognize the heavy and the light chain. But if they inject the rabbit crystallizable or constant fragment, then it only recognizes the heavy chain. Okay, and so they worked out the structure of an antibody as this, um, as this by, uh, this, this molecule that has a two recognition domains and one constant domain. Okay, so this is sort of a, a, a stylized picture of an antibody. We'll go into some detail about the actual structure, but there, this is a Janeway version of it where you have, um, you have the FAB parts of the antibody, you have the FC parts of the antibody, and then each of these boxes is called an Ig domain, and we'll get into that a little bit more. The main thing I want you to differentiate right now, though, 
is that there is some terminology. Technically, a B cell receptor is a membrane bound version of an antibody. An antibody is a secreted version of a B cell receptor. Okay, so they are, if you were talking about B cells that came from, from one progenitor B cell, they're going to have the same sequence of a B cell receptor or antibodies. Now, they are both members of the immunoglobulin family. And this was originally defined by saying you know, immune receptor type proteins, but we now know that, that the basic structure that's used to make BCR or antibodies is a very stable structure that's used on many different proteins, many of which don't have anything to do with the immune system. Okay, so these, these would include the T cell receptor, there's signaling proteins, there's adhesion proteins, and some of them are, are, are not immune related, but it's a very common structure. So it's, an, it's called the Ig family. Okay, so for the purpose of this course, the B cell receptor is the membrane bound version of an antibody and the antibody is the secreted version of the B cell receptor. If you have those from the same B cell clone, they will have the same amino acid sequence. The only thing that will be different is this transmembrane tail that the B cell receptor has, but the antibody doesn't. And that actually results from alternative mRNA splicing that we'll go into in, in later in, in the semester. This doesn't change what the B cell recognizes though. Like they have the same sequence. Dr. Blackman? Yes. What are the hexagon shapes on the antibodies? Those are glycosylation sites. So it's a heavily glycosylated molecule. Um, it's just difficult to draw those in any effective way. So Jane would make some little hexagons for, for uh, you know, five carbon and one oxygen rings. Okay, now when we refer to the B cell receptor, this include, can include a number of other signaling proteins. And so in this example, the B cell receptor itself doesn't, <coughs> excuse me, doesn't have any signaling proteins or signaling domains in it. The B cell receptor associates with these other immunoglob immunoglobulin family proteins called Ig alpha and beta which have the signaling domains, and we call those intracellular tyrosine activation motifs. Okay, and those we'll go through later in the semester. Right now, it's, it's not important for the structure of it, but just know that the B cell receptor, if we say B cell receptor, we can also mean all the other proteins that are part of that complex. The other part of that complex is complement receptor two. Right, you remember this from our last section. This is the protein that binds to IC3B. C3, B. Look like a two year old writing, but this is part of the B cell receptor complex. And so it would make sense that if you're going to transport antigen to a lymph node to present it to a B cell, if the B cell can also recognize the IC3B component that's bound to antigen, it'll recognize antigen by the B cell receptor and also recognize IC3B, and that provides the co-receptor signal. Right now, all I need you to know, there are other proteins that are associated with the B cell receptor. I don't need you to know about the signaling cascades or how it all works, just that BCR can mean a multi-protein complex. Typically, if people mean that, they'll say like, the B cell receptor complex rather than the B cell receptor. Okay, so let's talk about the nomenclature. Okay, so every B cell receptor or antibody in humans is composed of two identical heavy chains and two identical light chains. So this heavy chain is exactly the same as this heavy chain. This light chain is exactly the same as this light chain. Now, um, we typically call those IgH for heavy and IgL for light. But for the light chain, there's actually two different versions. And there's a strong bias depending on what species you're talking about. 
but IgL can mean Ig kappa or Ig lambda. So question, can a B cell express both a kappa and a lambda? No. No, they, don't, they, have, they get to choose one. They're only gonna, if it, all of the antibody, all of the light chains are the same, you only get one choice, okay? So a B cell during development chooses either kappa or lambda, but whichever one it chooses, that's its light chain. There's no known difference in function and it's not clear why we have two sets of those genes, but we do, and many species do. So um, if you want to do immunology research, you can figure out why there's two. Well, the heavy chains contain the transmembrane regions here that allow it to be inserted into the membrane. Okay, so when it's expressed as a B cell receptor, those are present and it's stuck in the membrane. Now, an important part of this, if we go back to Rodney Porter uh, experiments where they did a disulfide bond reduction, these chains are held together by disulfide bonds. Let me erase these and point out where they are. And there's a number of them. The light chains are held to the heavy chains by a disulfide bond. The heavy chains are held to each other by a disulfide bond. But those aren't the only ones. Each of these sort of rectangles or shapes here, they also have a disulfide bond that folds them uh, into a particular shape called an Ig domain. So if you were to count up disulfide bonds in this IgG molecule, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 disulfide bonds, okay? So there's one in each domain, and then there's one holding the light chains to heavy chains, and there's two actually holding the heavy chains together. Now the antibodies, as we just said, can be heavily glycos glycosylated, and this helps with their stability, and it helps them not to be recognized by your own immune system. And so, but we don't really talk much about that in this class, to just that there can be sugars attached to these. Okay, now when we're talking about sort of the different parts of the antibody, there is the variable regions and the constant regions. And what you'll immediately notice is if you were to do the Rodney Porter experiments and, and cut with papain, your FAB fragments, right, are here. They have a variable domain or a variable region and part of the constant region. Whereas if you cut the FC fragments, it only has the constant region. So the vast majority of an antibody molecule is constant regions. And even within the variable region, most of that is framework. So it's really constant, it's only the very tips of the antibody that matter for, an for antigen or epitope binding. Now, each of these shapes is called an Ig domain or immunoglobulin domain, and it has a very specific shape. And the easiest way to think of this is this is a beta pleated sheet taco. Okay, and, and also I'll come back to that. Now, if we look back at different Ig domain, you have uh, between four and five. So a heavy chain can have one, two, three, four, can actually have five different um, domains, but it always will only have one variable domain. So this is your V heavy. And then it will have three to four constant domains and they're numbered starting distally. So this is C H1. This is two, this is three, and the one closest to the membrane would be four. Yeah, I already had all those already there, okay? Now, the light domain has two domains. 
has one variable or one variable domain and one constant domain. This is invariably something that I ask you on a test. Tell me where is the FAB? Tell me where's the variable heavy region, the constant heavy region one, just label a diagram. The variable domains together form the antigen binding portion of the B cell receptor. So the red variable domains together form the variable region, and that is what binds to antigen. Okay, the rest of it, the constant domains, determine whether it's membrane bound or secreted. Um, it, that defines which isotype it is, and if you have a different isotype, those antibodies can have different function. IgM antibodies are good at initiating complement. IgA is mucosally secreted. IgE has, is typically just very low and bound to mast cells. So they have different roles based on that constant region. Okay, and so a BCR on the surface of a cell is divalent, an individual one, which means it has two binding sites per, per molecule. However, if you think about it, a B cell receptor typically expressing about a thousand B cell receptors per cell. And so it's actually very highly multivalent. It's just, there's lots of them on an individual cell. A secreted antibody can be divalent, meaning just two an antigen binding sites, but it can also have higher valency if it's multimerized. And we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, now the important part of that is the more binding sites you have, the higher avidity. You remember back to biochemistry, affinity is the interaction of one thing with another thing. Avidity is the product of all of those interactions. And so if you have, um, first of all, if you had one FAB, that may have an affinity, but a antibody that has two FAB fragments associated with it has a much higher avidity. It's not just two times, it's, it's the product of both of them. Now, when you look at an actual antibody, um, it doesn't look like this sort of cartoonish boxes, right? It has these immunoglobulin domains. And so you can see here, it's a beta pleated sheet that's folded on top of itself. There's one, two, three, four, okay? Now in this picture, the blue is the exact same sequence as the yellow. It just they separate it so you can see them. The light chain, here we have the, the variable light and the, the variable, or sorry, the light, constant light. <coughs> So it actually is, looks a little more complicated, but um, it's just really, it's got these hinge regions where you have the antigen binding part sticking out and the FC part in here that determines the function. And so if we were to draw it in, in, in a cartoon form, a little nicer, it would have, you know, essentially, here's your two light chains, and then here's your one heavy chain, there's your other heavy chain, but it just gets cumbersome to draw it actually like this. It's much easier to draw it in this sort of this stick form, just so it's easier. The important part here, though, is that there is a, flint, uh, a hinge region, right? And the hinge region allows these arms of the antibody to sort of flex and move around. And so they can point in the same direction or they can sort of swivel around and that hinge region allows the antibody to bind much better to, to its antigen. <clears throat> okay, so we've talked about a little bit about this, what an immunoglobulin domain is. And it, it really has a characteristic fold, which is the immunoglobulin taco. Because we're in Arizona, tacos are great here. Um, but it's really two beta pleated sheets that are folded on top of each other and stapled there with a disulfide bond. So if you were to look at, <clears throat> sorry, the light chain uh, C domain, you can see that there's, there's these beta pleated sheets and they have two sides. Here you have the left-hand side and the right-hand side. 
and those get folded on top of each other and then stapled together by this disulfide bond. And that's true also for the light, uh, for the variable domain, right? Most of it is just the beta pleated sheets. And so that's the framework part of it. So it has the red side and the blue side, and you can see that they're folded on top of each other and then stapled together with this disulfide bond. So I like to call it a taco. Other people, you can call it whatever you want but it's just basically beta pleated sheets that are folded and stapled with a cysteine-cysteine bond. Now this occurs in the variable region, it occurs in the conserved regions. And so it's a, just a typical structure that's used in a lot of proteins. And because it's beta pleated sheets are stable on their own, and then you fold it over in, with a disulfide bond, this makes it an extreme, extremely rigid and stable structure that is used in many different proteins in biology. Okay, so anything colored here though, the blue and red, even though this is the variable domain, is a structural. It's not part of the antigen binding. The actual antigen binding parts of it are just these tips, okay? Now, a lot of times people will draw it like this. And that's, be, instead of drawing just these boxes, other textbooks by Abula Boss or um, sometimes this is in, in Peter Parham's textbook, you'll draw it this way. They'll draw them as sort of a circle with a disulfide bond here. And that's just to remind everybody that these are in fact folded over and stapled. And so you can, and it does make it easier to see where are all the disulfide bonds. One, two, three, four, and then you have these four, you have the heavy to light chain, of these four, okay, so you've got 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And those are, that's just to sort of remind everybody what they really look like, as opposed to just drawing boxes. I don't care which, which version you like. When I draw an antibody, I typically use this version, right, that has these because it's, it's easier for me to just draw them as, as opposed to boxes, but Either is, is fine and commonly accepted. Okay, so, so uh, but it's easier to highlight here where you have all of these cysteine bonds. And so I just sort of highlighted them here. You have ones within each Ig fold or immunoglobulin taco fold, right? These disulfide bonds. You have the heavy to light chain disulfide bonds and then the heavy to heavy chain disulfide bonds. And that really allows this whole thing to be very stable. Antibodies persist in your serum for long periods of time because they're very stable proteins. Okay, now let's get back to the antigen binding parts of this. Okay, and it turns out to be just the very tips of the Ig fold. And this was first recognized by, um, se by sequencing a lot of different antibodies. And what they found was that, that most of the variation occurred in three different regions. And these were called the hypervariable regions. Okay, so there's hypervariable region one, hypervariable region two, and hypervariable region three. Now we'll come back to this, or particularly when we go through B cell development, Hypervariable region three is the most variable. It shows the most variation. We now know that, that, that really as we've sequenced more, these have become more pronounced. Now, as it happens, when they looked at parts of the antibody that actually if they mutated it would abolish binding, they found out that the hypervariable regions completely matched up with the complementarity de determining regions. Now they def they're defining the same thing, but they came about it from two different angles. One from sequencing lots of different antibodies and seeing what was different between all of them. And one looking at, if I take a single antibody and I start mutating it, which parts define the antigen binding part of that molecule? And they found that they're the same thing, okay? And so each variable domain has three hypervariable regions that 
could correspond to the three complement complementarity determining regions. Now these are the parts of the antibody here in red that actually bind to antigen. And you can see that most of that variable, uh, right, if this is the variable light domain, most of that variable light domain is just structural. It's just the little uh, three antigen binding parts that define what the antibody is going to recognize. Now, in a given antibody, you have heavy chain has three CDR regions and the light chain has three CDR regions. So you actually have six for each FAB, right? You have CDR1, 2, and 3 for the heavy region or the heavy chain variable domain. And CDR1, 2, and 3 for the light chain domain. Okay, so they form a three dimensional antigen binding site. And so that, that allows that antibody to have many different facets to figure out what is it going to bind to. All of them can make contact with antigen. So you can have, um, you know, it, in many cases, the CDR1 and 2 are dominant. Sometimes it's the CDR3, but they all can touch their epitope. And so here is actually a crystal structure. I believe this is from David Garbosi's lab. And so here's a, uh, an FAB fragment, this whole thing. Here's our heavy chain CH1 domain, heavy chain variable domain, light chain, very uh, variable domain and light chain constant domain. And this is the antigen. And so they're really saying at this interface, what are the different parts binding? And you can see that all of the CDR3 or CDR are touching the antigen. So CDR1, CDR2, and CDR3 from the heavy chain. And then CDR3, CDR1, and are and CDR1 and 2 for the light chain. Now look, if you look at this carefully, they're all mixed together, okay? So this is the, all the CDR are, find, are forming a three-dimensional shape that can bind to a three-dimensional antigen. Okay, so that comes back to how do B cells and antibodies bind to things and they bind to conformational shapes. And this is really what we've talked about as epitopes. This is the shape of the protein or what is recognized on, on the antigen. And they can be very different shapes. And so for small molecules, they can, they can essentially be engulfed by the antibody. They can recognize uh, tubular structures or, or quite large surfaces, or they can actually in Check part of the CDRs inside of an antigen. And this is very important for things like HIV, where you have to, one arm of the antibody has to get in and bind to the, to the GP41 protein to prevent, um, prevent the, the glycoprotein from allowing cells or virus to get into cells. And so that's a common thing for, for uh, virus neutralizing antibodies and actually to make these long arms of the antibody Okay, so this epitope is the shape that's recognized. If we were to take this example, this is actually the epitope, where the whole thing is the antigen. Or if this were part of a bigger thing, say this went up here, the whole thing would be the antigen, whereas just the epitope is the part that's being recognized. So, what determines whether a antibody will bind or not? Well, to do this, you have to go all the way back to, uh, to organic chemistry, right? What are the strongest molecular interactions? Well, you're not having covalent bonding, right? Because this is, that's a different chemistry. So we're really looking at charge interactions. And the strongest charges are full charges or ionic bonds. This is where you have a full charge binding to a full negative charge binding to a full positive charge. Then you go to hydrogen bonds, which are partial dipole moments or partial uh, charges, right? Where you have strongly electronegative um, atoms are, are, are being attracted to 
uh, strongly positive charge atoms. And then you sort of go to, if we were to actually do that, this is much, much weaker forces, right? Is going to hydrophobic interactions and Van der Waals forces. So Van der Waals forces are induced dipoles where it's a transient thing that's not really charged or electronegative, but it, due to other things that can be transiently. Hydrophobic interactions are really the exclusion of, of water or charge signals. And so they are, they're sort of the anti-ionic bond. Where they're, they're trying to not have charges interacting with those surfaces. But really the strongest the strongest um, binding is due to charge-charge interactions. And so an example of that is here, right? Where we have the strongest is an ionic bond. So here we have a side chain on our antigen, right? That has a, a amino group. And so it has a positive charge. Whereas on the antibody is a carboxylic group. And so it has a full negative charge. And so in this case, it actually is an ionic bond. A hydrogen bond is a variation of that where it's a partial. And we often write a sigma right here that this oxygen is actually going to bind to a hydrogen and pull the, the, um, pull the hydrogen this way. Another way to think of it is the electrons are, are being shared with the, the ligand. So those are the two strongest ones. On the other hand, you have sort of hydrophobic interactions and Van der Waals interactions, which are weak and they're mostly in the, in the insides of the antibody antigen complex where, <coughs> excuse me, it's the exclusion of water that's important. So when we talk about these, the strongest is the ionic bonds or the ionic bridges, then the hydrogen bonds, and then the hydrophobic interaction and Van der Waals forces. And in reality, those should be way down and the other one should be way up because they really uh, are determined by the, by the charge interactions. Okay, so let's talk about affinity here. Okay, now if you go back to chemistry, you have sort of a equation for a reaction is, is you have the total equation is how much is going to go forward and how much is going to go backwards. Okay, so we talk about that in biology as a dissociation constant, and we'll come back to why it is. And this is for a single FAV fragment binding to a single antigen. So here's our antigen, here's our FAV fragment. If they bind, then they form this complex. So the dissociation constant is determined by the off rate, how much they prefer to be separated, over the on rate, which is how much they prefer to be bound. Okay. And so we can measure this by a number of methods. Surface plasmon resonance is often what's used where you're looking association and then you wipe, it, wipe through a, a buffer and you see, well, how much of it falls apart. And that tells you um, how you can actually measure these. Are you going to have to do that in this class? No. Are you going to have to tell me what is the technique to do that? No, I just want you to know that there's an on rate where they're binding together and an off rate where they're coming apart. Now, typically for most antibodies, the on rate is pretty similar. It doesn't vary a lot. And the, the way to think about this is if you have an antigen and an FAB fragment floating around, no matter what, they're basically gonna bump into the antigen about the same rate. You know, so if it's really good, it might actually be attracted a little better. If it's not very good binder, then it may not have a very good on rate. But in any case, if there's some reasonable binding, then the on rate is going to be very similar. Okay, and so you can see here it doesn't change much. What really determines the antibody affinity is the off rate. How how quickly or how much does it fall apart? you can see that if you look at the off rates, these can vary quite a bit. This one is 0 0.08, where this is, is almost uh, 300 times higher, or 300 times higher. You have other ones that, you know, this is a huge amount of variation, 0 0.04 to essentially four is, is about a thousand fold, or sorry, a hundred fold 
difference, okay? Now, if you look at the dissociation constant, it really matches up with the off rate, not with the on rate. So you can see here the actual dissociation constant is much closer to the off rate here than it is to the on rate. And that's true for almost all antibodies. Now, the on rate may modulate that a little bit, but in reality, it's mostly determined by the off rate. Okay, but that's for one FAB fragment. Remember, valency changes this, and it changes the uh, avidity. Okay, so affinity is one binding interaction, one FAB binding to one epitope. Avidity is the product of multiple binding interactions. And remember, one antibody molecule is bivalent. So one IgG can bind two epitopes at the same time. And so if you have, you know, bacteria is gonna have lots of repeating elements. And so the antibody can bind to two different sites on the bacteria, two different, ep uh, two of the same epitope on one bacteria. Now, if we just think about two arms, right? And you go back to chemistry, you have sort of, here's our antigen one, our antigen two, and our bivalent antibody, meaning it has two binding sites. And so it can bind first antigen one or it can bind first antigen two. But when it does that, then it will bind the second antigen much faster. And that's shown here by these red arrows. Once one arm is bound, the other arm binds very quickly, and then it essentially becomes minimal reverse reaction. It doesn't fall off very easily. And so if you look at the difference between avidity versus affinity, can be quite high. So here's our two dissociation constants. One for a an, uh, antibody monomer, so this would be an FAB. Okay, and one for the full antibody, which is a dimer. So you look at the difference in dissociation constant, and it's quite high, right? It's 1.6 times 10 to the minus eight, and in for dissociation constants, smaller is stronger, and, and it's almost a 20 time difference. Most of that is from the off rate. The on rate is a little faster, right? So it, it goes from four to 6.7. So meaning when one arm binds, the other arm will bind a little faster and increase the on rate a little bit. But really, once this complex is formed, the dissociation rate is much, much less, meaning it's, it, it is much harder for this to fall off. And I think about it, if you're, <clears throat> for those of you who have gone rock climbing, if you have one arm holding on, you, you can move the other arm, right? It can bind, can release, can bind. Um, if you were only rock climbing with one arm, that would limit your opportunities. And so the antibody is the same way. If it's got two site binding sites, one arm can release, but it's much more likely to rebind rather than the whole thing falling off. Okay, so avidity is a much higher, uh, is a higher order interaction of many different binding sites. And again, it's mainly affecting the off rate. Okay, so then we get into this idea of cross-linking, and this is a very important part of immunology, saying that immune complexes are essentially aggregates of many antibodies bound to many um, antigens. And so in, if it's a soluble antigen, the cross-link antibody structures essentially become so large that they become insoluble and they precipitate, okay? You see this in, in other terms, in, in uh, yeast terms, it's often called flocculation, where yeast gets so big that they, they form big balls in the, in the uh, media. It's sort of the same thing, where antigen is cross-linking uh, structures, and essentially becomes a big uh, protein structure that precipitates. And the way that this was figured out was by, 
adding different amounts of antibody and antigen. So in this case, the antigen here is the same as the concentration as the antigen here, as well as here. But here, in very low do uh, doses of antibody, there's not enough, or, or the antigen is essentially bound each by one antibody molecule. Okay, so there's more antibodies than there is antigen, and so you don't have these big complexes forming. With very high concentrations of antigen compared to antibody, or another way to say it is low antibody concentrations, their an antibodies are bound to antigens, but there's not enough to actually cross link. It's only when you have sort of this one-to-one um, -one ratio or equal molar ratio of antigen and antibody that you start to see antibodies are going to bind to antigens, but they become cross-linked, and this forms these large complexes that become insoluble and precipitate. And what this looks like is, is uh, what's called a um, zone of immunoprecipitation assay. Essentially, the, the gel here, this is an agarose gel that has a constant amount of antigen in it. And so you add more antibodies, you punch a hole in it and you watch for the antibodies to diffuse in the gel. And if you put very high concentrations of antibodies, it has to diffuse out quite a ways to get this ring or precipitate. Whereas if you put very low concentration antibodies, it doesn't diffuse very far before you get this precipitate. It's really saying as it diffuses from that center hole, the concentration of antigen, or I'm sorry, of antibody as you come out of the hole gets less. And so to get to this equimolar amount, if you put high concentrations, it's got to go out farther. And if you have very low concentrations, it doesn't have to go very far before it's the right concentration to get precipitation. Now, for soluble antigens, that's sort of uh, interesting, but we don't really measure. They, they used to be a way to measure relative protein concentrations, believe it or not, but we don't do that anymore. What we typically um, use this valency or cross-linking is in agglutination. And you probably have all seen this, right? If you've done uh, red ABO blood typing, you've done this. Um, in this case, this is sheep red blood cells with increasing concentration of sheep red blood cell antibodies. And you can see as you get to the right amount of antibodies that you start to see clumping. And so um, in this case, it doesn't go away as you get more because there's so many antigens on the, on the surface of the cell that you can't actually get to the high, uh, high end where you don't see any um, aggregation anymore. But in, in reality, this is what you do when you do ABO blood grouping is you're looking for agglutination, which is just cell clumping instead of um, immune complex formation. Now what we use this for is um, there are many vaccines that are being developed that rely on immune complex formation before you actually inject anything because these are highly immunogenic. They are easily taken up by your innate cells and processed and presented, and they can be held on follicular cells very easily. So they're very immunogenic in terms of generating new B cell and T cell responses. Okay, so I encourage you to go back and make sure that these make sense for you to you. And then if you have questions, please uh, email or set up a time to meet with me to discuss this. I know it's a can be quite confusing because we often talk about antibodies just as one thing, but there really did many different parts of the antibody. Okay, so we covered the antigen binding part, right? Which is mainly the CDR1, 2, and 3 on the heavy chain and on the light chain. And now we're going to talk about the more of the structural parts of it. And you have different antibody isotypes. The isotypes are determined by which gene segments are being used for um, for the constant regions, okay? And you have a number of choices here. You have IgM, which is included by the constant mu domain. IgD, which is uh, encoded by the C delta gene segment. 
the IgGs, which there's actually several subclasses, which are the constant gamma uh, domains, and the IgE, which is C epsilon, and IgA, which is C alpha. Okay, so those don't change the specificity, they just change the function of the antibody. In a naive B cell, and first of all, a developing B cell before it's mature will only express IgM. A mature B cell will express IgM and IgD. It only switches to the other isotypes after being activated. In any given B cell, with the exception of IgM and IgD, a B cell can only express one isotype at a time. And so IgD is really the only exception, and that's just it's based, it's expressed on naive B cells, but it's um, it's not expressed on cells of other isotypes. And the isotype really determines the function of the secreted version of the B cell receptor or the antibody. Okay, so the first thing is that it determines the valency. So here's a antibody, an IgG um, antibody. You can see some of the disulfide bonds. Here's our, our light chains and our blue chains. Here's our heavy chain variable domain, uh, CH1, CH2, and CH3. But other ones, particularly IgA and IgM, form multimers. For IgM, we've seen this before, it's actually a pentamer, right? It has five different IgM antibodies in the entire IgM complex. Why? Well, what does IgM do? What's it good at? What have we talked about IgM before? In response to an acute infection. It is, but it's a landing pad for C1Q, right? C1Q is gonna come in here and bind and land on the IgM. And so that's one of the main jobs is to have lots of these binding sites so that C1Q can come in and stick to it. IgA doesn't form pentamers, IgA forms dimers. And really this allows the, these to be transported across the mucosal epithelia so that you have IgA in your, in your digestive tract or in, in sites of infection in your lungs or nasal passages. And so IgA is a mucosal antibody. It needs this J chain to multimerize it and the J chain is actually recognized by transport molecules. Now, remember, IgM, particularly early in infection, is low affinity. So having lots of these on there increases the avidity such that the IgM can bind to foreign things. Foreign thing response really is, is great. And so you get five of them arranged by one J chain. That allows you to have complement come in and, and start the initiation of the complement cascade. For IgA, it's a transport across the mucosa, but it's still using the J chain or the J protein. But once it's transported across the mucosa, you really want something that's uh, more stable. And so this also facilitates it being stable in the you know, harsh surfaces of the digestive tract. Okay, now we go back to the I idea of what the different the, the innate cells are directing the adaptive response. Here's something you should make a response to, but they also are signaling or they're also recognizing it's a bacteria, it's a virus, and telling those cells which antibodies are gonna be most useful. Okay, so the differences in, in the innate recognition ultimately lead to differences in which isotype is being switched to. So if we think about these different isotypes, I'm not gonna get into the different IgG subtypes or IgA subtypes. I'm gonna lump them all together. But really they have different jobs. IgM is expressed first. It's low affinity, but high avidity. And so it's great at activating complement. IgD has a, a specific role. It's on naive B cells. It does not have a secretion signal domain. It does sometimes get yanked out of the membrane, but it's not secreted. Um, so it's, basically just aids in activation of naive B cells. 
IgG is mainly function, or main function is to be in the serum and in the, the lymph. And it is basically to neutralize anything that's already gotten in and it's gone systemic or system wide. Okay, so some of the, the IgG antibodies, they uh, neutralize stuff, they opsonize it. So it's, it's taken in by macrophages and other phagocytic cells easier. It act, can activate complement, it can activate NK cells. IgG is your sort of general purpose system wide antibody. IgA has two subclasses and they're both transported to mucosal sites. Their basic job is to push things back from, from your epithelia and try and neutralize stuff before it gets in. IgE though is binding to FC epsilon receptors on mast cells, remember on, on granulocytes. And so this can activate if you have a parasitic infection or in the case of allergies, when you make a, an improper response. So they have different roles. And we'll go through those very quickly here in the last 15 minutes. Okay, so I know you all love the complement cascade. It's a, sort of one of those things that's hard to, to like, but once you actually realize how important it is, that it, it is one of the fundamental problems in immunology that we need to know how to get this started in order to get everything else moving. And so what happens is when IgM binds, and I think there was a question on, on this from a student on the previous lectures, when it binds to, uh, let's say this is a big bacterial surface, it actually has, undergoes a conformational change that exposes the C1Q binding sites. And they're not seen when it's in the planar form or the unbound form, okay? So it really does form this landing pad. C1Q then comes in and recognizes those, um, those binding sites and that activates C1R and then C1S. This cleaves C2 and C4, you get the C4B, C2A, that's a, um, will come in and then uh, convert C3. And then you have the classical C3 convertase, C4B, C2A, C3B. <clears throat> And this deposits lots of C3B on the, on the surface. This is the classic uh, complement, uh, this is the classical complement cascade. And it's really what the purpose of IgM is for, is to initiate complement. And it can be either the membrane attack complex where you have C5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It can be CR1 phagocytosis. As this is converted to C3, IC3B, it can be transport by CR2. But it's really, this is how we tell the difference between um, stuff that we don't want to infect us in our own cells. Okay, so if we put this in terms of our previous slides, the IgM is, um, is the first that's being made, right? And so it's great for initiating complement, which further activates the entire uh, uh, adaptive response. And it's the same, pathway where you're talking about uh, C1S cleaving C4 and C2, that's then going to cleave C3, and that initiates the membrane attack complex. Now the, the key inhibitor of this is really, you don't have C1Q binding to free IgM because it, it needs to be bound in the staple form to ha expose those C1Q binding sites. Only after you get C1Q binding does that conformational change result in C1R and C1S activation. And so during this time, if, if there's the complement is binding other things, there are ways to inhibit that. And one of them is the C1 inhibitor, which is displacing C1R and S from C1Q they knock them out of the equation, and so even if C1Q uh, binds, it doesn't do anything. Okay, so in terms of antibody function, IgM is the complement activator. IgG is the, is the general all-purpose antibody that's in your serum. And this is most of what we've talked about this semester is actually IgG. And we talked about Ehrlich and, and transferring antibodies. And so there's a lot of ways this can be recognized. It, it can bind to stuff it, and neutralize it. 
it can bind to stuff and make it uh, easier to take up by macrophages and, and other cells to degrade it, and that's called opsonization. It can um, bind to antigens expressed on infected cells and initiate um, antibody-dependent cytotoxicity, and that's usually by NK cells. And so what happens is you have, let's say you have an infected cell here, and you're expressing viral glycoproteins. So let's say this is uh, HIV, GP41, and GP120. The antibodies can bind to that, and then FC receptors on the NK cells can bind to the antibodies. And so here, this is an FC uh, receptor. It's binding to the antibody, it's binding to the uh, viral life protein on a target cell. So that's, then that NK cell will use perfinin granzyme to activate the caspase 3 and the, and the apoptosis pathway and kill a target cell. Okay, so there's, IgG really has got all the, all the things. It can do neutralization, can initiate some of the isotypes can, or the subtypes can initiate complement. It can coat things and make them degraded by, um, by phagocytic cells easier. Or you can get NK cells, recognize antibodies bound to infected cells and, and, and killing of target cells. So IgG is just a general purpose antibody in a serum. Is there a question? Yeah, um, what do you mean when you say isotype switching? So we'll get into that when we talk about B cells, but a B cell starts with IgM and depending on the signals that it uses, it will change the constant domains, but not change the variable domains. And so it'll okay. change which genes it uses. If we go back to here, this the IgM means the protein. C mu means which constant region gene set is it using. So once it changes from C mu to C gamma, it's changing only the colored regions. It's not changing the variable domains and it's not changing the light chain because the light chain doesn't have isotopes. Okay, thank you. And we will go into that more throughout the semester of how that happens and what are the signals. Okay, so IgM is complement, IgG is all purpose, everything in the serum. IgA is a mucosal or a secreted antibody. Okay, it's produced by your plasma cells in either the bone marrow or in actual mucosal lymphoid tissues. And then it's actually uh, recognized by uh, different sets of receptors that will bind to the antibody and transport it from the basal side to the luminal side of the mucosa. So if this was your small intestine, this is the food side or the commensal bacteria side. This is underneath the epithelia, right? And so this, this structure that is transported across and what happens is that the dimeric IgA with a J chain binds to the poly Ig receptor, which is here. And as that is transported across, um, to the apical side or the luminal side, there are proteases that are degrading the poly Ig receptor. And it ends up leaving part of the poly Ig receptor stuck to the IgA. And this is called the secretory component or, or the secretory component of the poly Ig receptor. The whole point of it is it's sort of an extra layer of protection against de degradation. If you're going into the lumen of the intestinal epithelia, so you've got lower pH, you've got all these other sort of environmental hazards, and so you're trying to stabilize the antibody in that environment. The whole point of IgA is to neutralize pathogens, or actually commensals for that matter, so that they don't get to attach to the epithelia of your mucosal surfaces. You have IgA in all of your mucosa, and its whole job is sort of push back things away from the epithelia so that it 
it can't get into the system. Okay, so the last isotype is IgE. Now, if you were to look for IgE in the serum, it's actually measured, it's so low that it's measured in a different way. You can't detect it directly. You have to detect it enzymatically by looking for activity. Um, it's mostly not in the serum. It's mostly bound to FC epsilon receptors on mast cells and basophils. And it's really looking for, you know, it gets bound on them, on the mast cells and basophils, and it's a surrogate receptor. It's using, those cells are using that to look for parasites or in the case of allergy, things that come in. And it causes the mast cell to degranulate. Remember, FC epsilon is a high affinity receptor. And so this is basically, if this is our mast cell, it's decorated on its surface with lots of these IgE molecules. And it's just using those and, and saying, is, if the parasite comes in, can I recognize it? And so it's holding the antibody on its surface for long periods of time. Unfortunately, if you're allergic to pollen or other things, birch pollen or uh, birch proteins, when those come in, that mast cell degranulates and releases histamines and other things that make you feel allergic and not so great. But the real job of IgE mm. is to help your mast cells and, and basophils respond to parasitic infections. Was there a question? Okay, so the last few minutes, I'm gonna talk about polyclonal versus monoclonal antibodies. And you probably have heard these terms. If I immunize you with something, you will always make a polyclonal response. Even the smallest antigen, or, or what we'll call haptins, make an, many different antibodies. Right? The, your B cells are going to recognize in many different ways. A monoclonal antibody is the result of a laboratory isolation of a single B cell and isolating that, growing up that B cell so all of the B cells make the exact same sequence of antibody. So what happens? is we typically do this in rabbits or the easiest, they just happen to be, have really strong antibody responses. And you inject those rabbits with an antigen. Now in the serum, you will get polyclonal antibodies, recognizing many different epitopes on that antigen, okay? So anyway, anything that's exposed, the antibodies will, will B cells will recognize it and make antibodies to it. So to get to a monoclonal, you have to take those antibody producing B cells from the rabbit and you may have to make them immortalized. And so the way that we do those is we take myelomas, which are a B cell cancer that does not express its own antibody and you fuse these cells together in a limiting dilution, meaning there's only one of these cells in a well with one of these cells. When you do that, you get an immortalized cell because it's from, it's from the myeloma and it's antibody producing because it's from the B cells. And that is what we call a hybridoma. And the hybridoma is immortalized and now it's all of those cells because it's the result of one fusion event will make this antibody with the same protein sequence. And that is what we call a monoclonal antibody. You don't get monoclonals from an in vivo antigen exposure. You have to do this in the lab. Okay, so that's the structure of antibodies. And we're gonna come back to that when we're talking about somatic recombination and how antibodies function later in the semester. But this is, gives you sort of a rough idea of how does an antibody actually do its job? Okay, so here's some of the key points that I think you should know. Antibodies are secreted BCR. You should be able to draw me an antibody and tell me where are the variable regions, where are the constant regions, where are the disulfide bonds, um, where is the antigen binding part, where is the transmembrane domain. There's a number, number of different cartoon ways of doing that, but I think being able to draw an antibody or label an antibody on an exam would be a high priority. Um, antibodies typically have very high affinity for antigen, particularly after response. Uh, 
but it's non-covalent interactions and you should be able to tell me what are the strong interactions that allow binding. Describe what's the difference between affinity and avidity and how does it affect um, the binding? Is it K on or K off that affects that? And then tell me how you would actually make a monoclonal antibody and how that would differ from polyclonal. Um, and then we talked about this idea of, of immunoprecipitation and agglutination from cross-linking of antibodies and antigen or cells, okay? Those are sort of the summary of this, of this lecture, but I think those are, would be the things that I would focus on for an exam. Okay. So here's a question. There are people that have what's called selective IgA deficiency. And in this, parent patients have normal or elevated levels of IgA in the serum, but they don't really have any IgA in their mucosal sites. And then what this results in is, is frequent opportunistic bacterial infections, where bacteria are able to gain access to that luminal epithelial side and eventually cause an infection. If you're a physician and you say, okay, well, what, what could cause this? Tell me what, what's one way that this could happen? This patient could have a problem with what? And for that, you can get one point, excuse me, on the uh, extra credit on the final exam. Your answer doesn't have to be correct. You just have to make a good attempt. And then that's where I'll stop and take any questions. Sorry, we went a couple of minutes over. I had a question about the uh, myelomas. Um, isn't there like downsides to injecting cancer cells into your body and don't they get attacked by the immune system? You're not doing this in vivo. You're taking out the antibody producing cells from the rabbit. And then in a tissue culture dish, you're, you're fusing them with, by using polyethylene glycol, which is antifreeze, right? And so you're not injecting myelomas into the rabbit or a human. You're doing all of this in vitro in tissue culture. Oh, okay, so the hybridoma isn't exactly like as, um, as dangerous, I should say, I guess. Uh, You're as not going to inject the hybridoma into anybody either. You just keep Oh, you just use those to make the antibodies. Oh, I think I misunderstood. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah, you're, you're just keeping those growing in culture. And because you fused it with the immortalized myeloma, it's now also immortalized. But you, yeah, you would never put that back into a person or a, an animal. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lotman, I have a question about immunoprecipitations, or is it the same thing as a pull down? And in what scenario would you want to do this kind of experiment just to determine um, like antibody concentration or, or something? Or what, in what context would you do this? So it is exactly the same thing as an antibody pulldown. The only difference typically in an antibody pulldown is you're taking it one step further. So you use antibodies to bind your target antigen or protein, and then you're using protein A or protein G to bind to the antibodies. And the way that that works is that protein A and protein G have, are multivalent, and so they can bind lots of antibodies and sort of help the whole cross-linking thing. Um, and so it just makes it easier to get to this, if we go back to what we're looking for, is this. And so protein G or protein A will actually, you know, form these big complexes and allow this to form easier. But it's the same idea. What was the second half of your question? Um, yeah, that answered most of my question. I was just wondering, like, in which context would you want to do uh, an IP experiment? Like, when you're, what, what question would you be faced with when you want to do this? Well, in the olden days, they used to use it to get relative protein concentrations. So, um, you would put, you know, your unknown into the gel and say, if I, if I have um, different levels of antibody, how far out does it go? You could also do this where you put the antibody in the gel and you just put the serum in the, in the well and say, 
the farther out it goes, the higher concentration it is. Now, we don't do that anymore because we have spectrophotometers and other ways of measuring protein levels. It's an old clunky way um, to do it. People don't really use that as a assay today. What they use it for is vaccine formulations because immune complexes are very immunogenic. You're basically adding antigen that you've already added antibody to at the right proportion to get these big clumps of antigen. And then that's what you inject. And that is, is better at initiating immune responses than just antigen on its own. Thank you. Um, yes, Carrie Ellis. Um, I love that you actually have Princess Bride quotes in here. You know that movie is almost 40 years old, right? Okay, so one of the questions is how do we determine the valency of an antibody? And a lot of that is we've worked out what the protein structure is. So if an antibody's got two FAV fragments, it's got two, a valency of two. Um, in terms of analytical techniques, you, there are ways to do this by um, measuring K on and not K off. And so, but I, I think mostly it's based on structural things because we know constant regions result in certain structures. There was a question if you can have SI sections or sessions. I don't know what SI means, but I'm more than happy to meet with, with people if they have questions about the material. A quick question about the next exams. We'll, we'll still be using lockdown browser, right? Uh, just given the... Um, pain in the butt that lockdown browser was and the fact that everybody's got a cell phone or an iPad or some other computer. I don't really think it's that useful. And I think we'll just probably make them their open book, open notes, open web. If you think that's going to be helpful, you can search for stuff, but uh, I don't, you know, the, the part of the reason that, that the tests are geared the way they are is because Eventually, if it was short, you could look up stuff and and get every question correct. But in reality, if you don't know, understand it, it takes longer to look it up than it does to to just answer it. So, short answer is probably not. Probably will not use the lockdown browser. Hey, thank you. Any other questions? Actually, I have a quick one. Um, it's kind of specific. Um, I'm using, in my lab, I'm using IgY from chickens. Does that come from a, because I know humans don't have them. So do chickens have a gene that's like uh, lambda or what does the Y stand for in those antibodies? That's the heavy chain constant domains. Yeah, so what gene it, um, is encoding for that? Well, in chickens, I think it comes from, uh, I don't know what the terminology that they use, um, but it's, it's from, what is Y? It's just a different isotype that, that chickens have. I think, it's, I think it's defined, Y is defined by its in yolk. I remember. Mm 
Okay, that makes sense. I'm just curious. Thank you. Dr. Botlin, I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, what do they mean when you see, uh, oh, it'll say something like the FAB2 portion of the antibody is binding. What is the FAB2 portion? Okay, so in the Porter experiments, let me go back all the way back up here. Can you see my screen still? Yes. Okay. If instead of papain digestion, if they had used pepsin digestion, it would actually cut it after. Sorry. It would actually cut it here rather than here. And so what that would leave is these two heavy chain parts of the this would still be connected. Okay, but this part would be obviously cut off. But now you've still got the two FAB stuck together, right? Because they're still linked by these disulfide bonds. That would be an FAB2, meaning oh, two okay. FABs that are still stuck together. Two parts of the constant region are still there. Right, so papain cuts above those disulfide bonds, pepsin cuts below them. And so if you use pepsin digestion, they're still stuck together. You use papain, they're actually cleaved off of it. Okay, thank you. Anything else? All right, we'll see you on Thursday.